that fateful day. By many, it was just called that day. Rufus witnessed the miraculous events from the small town of Cam, which was not very far from Midgar. Midgar's hospitals would soon be besieged by crowds of people, and it would be impossible to guarantee Rufus's safety. So when Rufus had barely regained consciousness, Reno suggested that he should be moved to a small house in Cam, which belonged to the Shinra company. He was being transported by helicopter, so he could have been taken as far away as they wanted, but Rufus insisted on Cam. He respected the opinion of his subordinates, so he agreed to relocate to Cam, but he refused to just continue fleeing from one place to the next in the face of the impending destruction of the planet. Meteor was so close that you would think you could reach out and touch it. With such a surreal situation before them, the four Turks patrolled Midgar. They had taken care of Rufus's safety, but with Meteor's imminent impact, that was quite a contradiction in terms. They decided to carry out their orders until the very end. There is no point in thinking about what happens after Meteor's impact. We will keep working and assume the planet will overcome this disaster. With those words, Song ordered his subordinates to assist in the evacuation of Midgar's population. The city was now under the influence of Meteor. The increasingly strong storms and the violent earthquakes brought down the first of the buildings. The city of steel screamed as though it was caught in surprise. It's just like the chief to use his last orders for good deeds. What? Atonement. <laughs> yeah. Finally, even the former leader of the Turks, Veld, and their old colleagues arrived in Midgar. Reno thought this must be a mirage conjured by Meteor. Once long ago, the Turks had acted in a manner that was not in the best interest of the company. They had saved the world, and at the same time, also Veld and his daughter, who had got caught in the crossfire. Now that Reno thought about it, the cohesion among the Turks had probably never been as strong as at that time. As he helped them to evacuate the inhabitants of Midgar, Reno couldn't help but feel a certain nostalgia. After the incident, President Shinra and the executives ordered the Turks to be disbanded, or rather, killed. It was the Vice President, Rufus, who rescued them from their predicament, and now they had just saved Rufus. Reno had a feeling he had done all that could be done. Now might come the end of the world. Rufus was their patron, and now that Reno had helped secure his safety and reunited with the colleagues he never thought he would see again, he was glad to have no regrets to leave behind anymore. On that fateful day, Meteor was destroyed just before its impact with Midgar. The destruction of the planet was averted at the last second. It was the power of the life stream bursting out of the planet that saved it. The ultimate white magic, Holy, had triumphed against the ultimate black magic, Meteor. Cloud and his comrades had played a significant role in saving the world, but the majority of the population would never know. Rather, the general perception was that the planet had saved itself. Reno and Rude had experienced the critical moment not with their colleagues, but in the Shinra building, directly in the shadow of Meteor. Why does it have to happen now? The building trembled with the impact of the live stream. Through the numerous windows it could burst into the interior of the building, raging like a wild snake of light through the rooms and hallways, destroying everything in its path. The two fled to a safe place, namely two cubicles in the staff toilet, and talked to each other through the partition. This is my fault. What is? If I didn't suggest we come back to collect the toolbox, then... Forget it, man. Now's not the time to feel sorry. Rude noticed an unusual tone in Reno's voice and stayed silent. Rude? Reno couldn't stand the silence any longer. What is it? Well, we've known each other for a long time, right? You could say that. We're buddies, right? Yeah. Well then, buddy. Rude noticed that Reno was back to his usual self. He could hear him opening the door of the cubicle and walking out. 
Just then, the door to Root's cubicle was kicked down. Root caught it and kicked it back with full force. What the hell? My last present to my best partner. A door? A thrill. The sort of thing you like. Not enough. Root walked out of the cubicle. Then why don't we take a look outside? I bet it's exciting. It's a festival. The two walked out of the front entrance and were greeted by strong winds kicked up by the live stream. Just then, a dazzling ray of light whipped past them. Whoa! That was the live stream, wasn't it? Reno! What? This is the best! Sung, Reno, Rude, Elena. Rufus turned to the four Turks the next morning after the live stream had passed. What do you all plan to do from here? Oh, I don't remember being fired. The others nodded in agreement to Reno's words. Rufus went on to give the Turks two orders. The first was to return to Midgar and gain an overview of the situation there. And the second was to gather allies. Just because people may be on our staff doesn't mean they're allies. Understood? I know that. But what use will be gathering allies now? What are you going to do? I want information for now. No matter how little or how much. Apart from a few ribs, Rufus had only broken his right foot and was suffering from whiplash. He was therefore in a wheelchair, but he still hadn't lost his dignity. Sung. Yes, sir. I'm sure you've been reprimanded. There are still many things only Shinra can accomplish. Rufus nodded, satisfied at his response. I'm sure this will be fun. The Turks broke into two groups and immediately set off for Midgar. Sung and Elena were responsible for gathering information, while Reno and Rude were responsible for gathering allies. Their former colleagues, who had gathered here, had already parted to gather information from places other than Midgar, and would forward it to Kam. Avalanche once said, Shinra was the planet's enemy. It was like Reno had just realized that. Yeah. Looks like they were right. Why's that? Look. It seemed Reno's observation wasn't wrong. The livestream had saved the planet from Meteor, but Midgar, the stronghold of the Shinra company, had paid an enormous price. The punishment from the planet wasn't the complete destruction of the city, but it would take a long time to rebuild it. Midgar was not dead, but it was far from being alive. It was as though a death sentence had been imposed in which they had forgot to set an execution date. And since the people were aware that it wasn't Shinra who had saved the planet, the company now faced hostility. The population probably needed a scapegoat, someone responsible for this global disaster. And soon Shinra fit the bill. Reno and Rude reached the vicinity of the Shinra building in Sector Zero. Although this part of the city had been devastated the most, there were a lot of people there. They had all come here, hoping for information and assistance. How ironic. Reno listened to the conversation between the evacuees. It was clear that they all considered the Shinra company to be the root of all evil. Yet they all wanted Shinra to be the ones to do something to improve their situation. I want to gag their mouths with my socks. Do it. I won't stop you. I don't have any spares. Sung and Elena were in Wall Market, in the slums of Sector 6. It was easy to come by information here, but it wasn't always reliable. Even so, the Turks used this resource regularly. It was now a mess. Fallen rubble and girders from the upper plate lay everywhere. Although it didn't look much better than this before the disaster. The slums were just slums. The only real difference was the number of people. The rumour that Midgar would collapse had apparently led many people to leave the area immediately under the plate, 
and to look for a place to stay at a safe distance. On their way there, Song and Elena had met many people who were angry at the Shinra company. There were even people who threw stones at them the moment they saw their Turks uniforms. It's kind of hard to go about our job. Why don't we change our clothes? They walked into the first clothing store they could find. Sung chose a t-shirt that made him look like a tourist on the beach of the Costa del Sol, while Elena opted for a chic designer one-piece. Freshly changed, they found a busy-looking bar. Surprisingly, there were plenty of people there. Almost every table was taken. No sooner had they sat down at one of the few free tables, they began observing the clientele. Sung's eyes were trained on a man wearing a black shirt, sitting alone at a table for four people. He's sleeping, right? He could be. Hey, so... What is it? I decided to stay with the Turks, partly because of my pride in work, but there's another reason. Elena had never tried to hide her affection for her superior, but until now, she couldn't tell him directly to his face. Continue. Hmm? It doesn't look natural if we stay silent. I don't care if you're just going to talk nonsense. Just talk. Nonsense? Elena sighed audibly, then looked at Sung. Sung seemed to be concerned about the sleeping man since they entered the bar. Strange. Sung got up and went over to the man, calling out to him. Are you all right? There was no answer. Sung put a hand on his shoulder and slightly shook him. Suddenly he felt something sticky on his palm. He quickly withdrew his hand. Turning it around, he found a sticky black substance. Sung looked at the man. His entire upper body was covered by the i Sung hadn't noticed it at first because he was wearing a black t-shirt. What's wrong? Elena got up and walked over to the table. He's dead. Reno and Rude were in the lobby of the Shinra building. Reno wrote something on a large billboard, roughly the size of an adult. Anyone who wants to leave the city, follow the railway tracks. No trains are in operation. No plans to resume service at the moment. There are no provisions here. The Shinra company has ceased operations until further notice. The house in Kam had two floors. On the ground floor was a living room, which was used for meetings, a dining room, a small kitchen, bathroom, and a toilet. The upper floor had three bedrooms, and Rufus was in one of them. He had his right foot in a cast now. Around his neck he wore a neck brace, and his torso was heavily bandaged, so movement without a wheelchair was still very difficult. Rufus watched the hustle and bustle in the town from his window. When he peeped through the gap in the curtains, he immediately noticed the many people on the streets. Calm had also been affected by the livestream, but there weren't many houses damaged to the point where they were uninhabitable. Many refugees had arrived from Midgar after hearing that it was safe here, which slightly intimidated Rufus. Since he could remember, he had never been around crowds without bodyguards or staff to contact. The notion that only a thin wall stood between him and the anger and discontent of the crowds outside made him a little anxious. And it was just a normal wall too, not the thick reinforced walls that the Shinra building had. The Shinra building was a fortress built by his father. Sooner or later, every son must leave his father's house and start on his own from scratch. For him, this time had now come. This was no time to fear the people out there. He had to dive in feet first and do what he had to do, and that could be nothing less than the reconstruction of the world. The doorbell rang, once, and then a second time. When he ignored it, the doorbell rang twice more. He wasn't expecting anyone. It wasn't someone he knew. Suddenly, he heard someone attempting to forcibly open the door. Rufus wheeled himself over to the bed, taking the revolver from underneath the pillow, hoping he wouldn't have to use it. He took the gun in his hand 
and pulled the sleeve of his robe over it with the other hand. He dragged the chair from the window over to the door, then struggled to pull himself from the wheelchair onto it. Rude had reinforced the door, so after a while it seemed the uninvited guest had given up trying to open it. For a moment, calm had returned, and the person had apparently left. But soon, the sound of breaking glass could be heard. It was clear to Rufus that the intruder had changed his strategy. From the subsequent noise, it seemed that more than one person had broken their way inside. Damn it. Rufus removed the safety lock from his revolver. It was evening when Sung and Elena set off toward Cam. They spoke mostly about the disease they had seen in the slums. After leaving the bar, they noticed many other people who had the same symptoms as the dead man. Did you learn anything about it while I was resting? It's the first time I've seen anything like that, Song. In other words, these symptoms had only started to manifest in Midgar. For Song, it was still too early to know anything about the disease. He wondered if there was anything different between today and yesterday. It was clear. The live stream. It had not only destroyed the city, but it also punished its inhabitants. I hope everyone can remain calm. Who knows? Elena remembered the panic among the customers in the bar when they noticed the dead man. At first they gathered around him and gawked curiously, but someone suddenly shouted, What if it's contagious? Panic broke out. It was every man for himself as they pushed and shoved, trying to get out first. Reno and Rude were a little ahead of Sung and Elena, and were already in the vicinity of Cam. In fact, they could have used the helicopter, but it was unclear at this time what the fuel situation was, so it was probably best to go easy on it for now. We go into Sector 5 tomorrow? Why would we go to the company residential area? Oh wait, you think there might be allies there? There's a warehouse there. I'd like to secure some vehicles. And weapons. Weapons, huh? Yeah, we'll need some. Ugh. Reno sighed audibly when he remembered the resentment he saw in the exhausted faces of the people of Midgar. They couldn't conceal their discontent from them. Rufus was surrounded by a handful of men. Looks like you've gotten yourself in quite a mess, Mr. President. An unshaven man, possibly the leader of the group, pointed a hunting rifle at Rufus. Indeed. But now's the time that I fear most. There is nothing more frightening than a foolish mob. Rufus looked into the bloodshot eyes of the man before him. He could see the blame in his eyes for everything that had happened and was sure he was going to be killed. He could probably take out one or two of them with his hidden revolver, but there were three of them in the bedroom, and he could hear a few more outside. It was impossible to kill them all. We might be foolish, but at least we know who should be taking the responsibility for everything that's happened. Oh? Then let me ask you this. What will you do after you leave this house? Have you thought about your futures? What do you mean? There are two kinds of people in this world. People who give orders and people who take orders. It is a question of one's abilities, not a trick question. Often when an incident occurs, it is the ones who give orders that are made to take responsibility. As a result, those who remain lose their direction and panic arises then everything comes to a grinding halt. Strange way to beg for your laugh. You might be leading a number of people here, but how long will that last? What kind of future can you give them? We're just a foolish mob, remember? If we survive today, that's all that counts, right? No, not we. It's just you. Rufus was aware that the others had set their sights on the leader now. You have some sort of plan? Rufus turned to look at one of the other men. He was in his thirties and seemed to be relatively wealthier. He wore an expensive looking navy blue jacket and had a sturdy build. Why of course. First I would secure my home, 
Calm can't shelter all the Midgar refugees. It looks like you're one of the locals here. Yeah? Do you want this town to become like Midgar? <sighs> the man was clearly imagining to himself what would happen. You could almost hear the clattering of cogs in his head. Surely we need to help the refugees. The man with the gun cut in, as though he wanted to reaffirm his status as leader. Take this for example. What do you do when it rains? Where would the overwhelming number of people go? Perhaps anyone would provide them shelter out of goodwill. But think about how big Midgar's population is. It may not be very big, but you can't shelter them all. Can you lay their discontent and anxiety to rest? What can you tell them when all you care about is living for another day? Shut up! The man raised his voice. Rufus stayed calm. It seemed he was right about the man. As the leader of a small group like this, he might be okay. But he couldn't be entrusted with a larger group. Well, you may be right. What exactly is your plan now, Mr. President? The man in the blue jacket had an understanding tone in his voice. Rufus considered whether this man was the real leader of the group. It would cost my life to tell you. When Reno and Rude arrived back in Cam, they immediately noticed that the town had dramatically changed since they left that morning. That's a hell of a lot of people. When they got to the house, the whole street was crowded. And not only that, there were strangers coming in and out of the house as they pleased. The president. The two immediately rushed to the house, but didn't go any further. The door was open. When they peeked inside, they saw men and women sitting, exhausted on the floor. Even in the entrance, some of them lay on their backs, seemingly asleep. They're all ill. Rude had quickly grasped the situation. The people had the same symptoms they saw in Midgar. Their clothes and bandages were soaked in a black liquid. Many of them gathered together. Rude, you check the first floor. Reno made his way upstairs, trying not to step on anyone lying there. It was the same up there. Reno was perplexed at what he saw as he searched for Rufus without success. He finally gave up and went back down to the hallway where he met Rude. I can't find him anywhere. Seriously? Let's go outside, partner. If we stay here, we're gonna get... Reno noticed one of the sick people glaring at him, and sheepishly smiled, urging Rude outside. Song and Elena had just arrived. Chief, the house has been overtaken. Reno tried to summarize the situation. We must find the president. He may have been taken away. We have to confirm if anyone knows what happened. I'll take the house. You guys can be a bit intimidating. Elena walked straight past them to the door. Elena, be careful. They've got the disease in there. Don't worry. If it were contagious, we would have been infected already. Her response seemed pretty obvious to Reno. Well then. Go. Find any witnesses. Reno and Rude nodded silently, then went off in different directions. The two eventually returned back to the house and reported to Sung the hateful tirades they had heard against the Shinra company. But nobody had seen Rufus. It can't be helped in this situation. Sung watched the sick and injured people in the street, unable to find the strength to walk on their own, and had to be carried. Even if there were witnesses, Sung figured it was unlikely they would tell him anything. 